Good afternoon. I'm more nervous than I should be probably uh, for this. I'll, I'll tell you why. My, uh, I told my wife earlier today uh, where I was going, uh, and she wondered aloud if maybe uh, they had meant to invite her and not, and not me to this. Uh, my wife has a, I told her we're going to be speaking in policy. My wife, of course, has a, a doctorate in that, was a Udall scholar, and used to run uh, an environmental concern from the Shedd Aquarium. So she laughed that I was going to be speaking to this group and said, you understand you'll know the least about this is than anyone in the room probably. <laughs> uh, what would trouble her is how often as a uh, state senator that is true. I'm speaking on a topic to a room who already know more than I do on any given topic. Uh, but uh, I, well, I am honored to be here today and talk about uh, and maybe give some perspectives on uh, policy and, and how it goes uh, and how it, certain policies work their way through the Illinois State Legislature. My first bill, and I'll, that was, I think, the reason for uh, my invitation today, was, as was pointed out, uh, related to the Muhammad Aquifer. Uh, the Muhammad Aquifer, for those that are not familiar, uh, is, of course, the underground river that uh, serves water for our entire region. It's about 14 different counties, uh, and uh, it is the water source uh, now is designated the sole source uh, of the drinking water for uh, about 800,000 people here in East Central Illinois. Um, what we, we put forward, and it was, it's not something that is new, it's just new that it actually got to the legislature this year, uh, is uh, the need to protect this water supply. For about 10 years, uh, and I'll show you here on a map, uh, this is, as you can imagine, um, Champaign County is, uh, as you can see there on the bottom uh, right of the screen, that shows you how massive the area that's served by the Muhammad Aquifer. Now, in about Seven or eight years ago, it goes on back quite a ways, uh, they're right in the middle in DeWitt County, a uh, waste, uh, a dump essentially, uh, had uh, set up shop there and began to apply or go through the process for uh, PCB uh, disposal. Um, this caught some attention uh, of those in the county, but not enough to uh, really draw too much attention for a year or two. Uh, but as that process went through, it began to attract more and more attention from politicians uh, on both sides of the political aisle. The, uh, there were Republican uh, congressmen, there were Democratic congressmen, uh, and in fact, a, uh, a young Senate, U.S. Senator named Barack Obama even uh, filed his objection to this because while it was uh, only one county that the, this material was being proposed to be stored, and as you can see, when you store uh, any kind of hazardous material over a water supply, it will affect the entire aquifer, or at least it had potential to, uh, if something goes wrong. And so that there began a process where um, many, um, many different groups began to weigh in, uh, and it began uh, the issue of, of whether or not uh, one company, if they are doing the responsible thing, and they would maintain and still do, that they uh, were uh, making sure all the precautions were in place to make sure that that waste would have been uh, stored responsibly. Um, I guess the question for too many was, what if you're wrong? Uh, what happens then once the water supply for 800,000 people uh, becomes tainted? And that uh, became really the crux of the fight. Uh, so the bill that was proposed earlier this year was one that had been proposed previously, but did not make it very far. Uh, said that essentially over any kind of water supply or over an aquifer in particular, you could not store any PCBs, uh, manufactured gas plant waste, and the like. Um, and uh, that made its way through the legislature, and there were uh, plenty of objections to that, um, citing that it was such a broad bill that it might, in many ways, uh, ensure that you couldn't store that kind of waste anywhere, no matter how, you, how responsibly you tried to, to do it. As you can imagine, the aquifer is this big, and then depending on how you try to write it, I see John in the back, John helped us try to narrow that down, John Marlin. Uh, and the, uh, the issue became, okay, but what about all the different ways that water can get into that? tributaries and all of them, and, um, different water supplies that you could argue somehow feed into this enormous body of water underground, um, it becomes very broad. And then the question is, are we killing the entire um, waste industry in the state of Illinois, which nobody had set out to do. Um, so the agreement was eventually reached that the company in question would withdraw their application with the federal EPA. They would no longer be seeking to uh, store PCBs over that water supply in this area. Um, and then the real issue became manufactured gas plant waste. That was, again, um, something that uh, nobody really wanted uh, there, but it was a newer concern and had not been the um, em emphasis of the initial legislation. 
what was interesting in this case, though, is that over the years, as I mentioned, there were people on both sides of the political spectrum who would weighed in on this. And that was really key toward this legislation passing. Uh, what was formed was a group called the, the Muhammad Aquifer Protection Alliance. It was a group of Central Illinois citizens. Let's see here, I'm now spelling two in separate words. Uh, but uh, so I should all have to be one sentence. But, uh, and, and essentially what this was was groups of um, mayors and community members from towns big and small across that map that I showed earlier um, that were really letting their government officials know this is not something that they, they, they want. Uh, and here in Champaign, that was manufactured gas plant waste was uh, something that was of particular uh, concern because we had had uh, some sites that had uh, manufactured gas plant waste. There were sites here locally um, that had uh, been sites of manufactured gas plant waste and, and I think was uh, let people kind of be aware of the need to address that now. So we went out with the Illinois EPA, which initially uh, had some concerns about the initial legislation. Uh, they said, you know, this is something that we need uh, because there's something called a T-clip or a toxicity test, um, which right now in practice, if you are above that certain level of toxicity, we don't want you to store it. Um, but there isn't anything in the law that, that guarantees that, and we're obviously uh, not happy about there being a gray area when you're talking about this kind of uh, material over your water supply. So what this bill uh, ultimately did was it, it prohibited the disposal of manufactured gas plant waste in municipal solid waste landfills unless that waste passes on that test. In other words, it has such a low reading of toxicity on those, the T-clip test um, that it, it's I believed to be safe to be stored there. Um, and uh, we codified in many ways uh, the best practices that the uh, environmental protection community was, was using. Um, and it was one of the few success stories that I think of the legislature this spring. Uh, if you're uh, a follower of all things in Springfield, but not, not a lot was uh, agreed upon uh, or continues to be agreed upon over the partisan line. Uh, but in this case, this was a bill that my uh, chief co-sponsor was a local Republican senator. Uh, and uh, he was very helpful, I think, and uh, as, as most of you know, the legislature is of one party, the governors of another. Uh, but this is one where it passed uh, in both houses, uh, despite having a lot of opposition at the beginning of that bill, and despite having failed under multiple uh, legislatures in the past. Uh, and it was signed into law by uh, Governor Rauner uh, earlier this summer. The manufactured gas plant waste uh, continues to be uh, an issue in, um, in many uh, different places in, in the country. Um, of course, a uh, manufactured gas plant um, is any industrial facility in which gas is produced from coal and oil. Uh, as I mentioned, there was a uh, community here, I believe it's called the, the Hill Street uh, area, where they had a massive cleanup here in Champaign uh, from an old power plant that basically all the soil around this old uh, plant was somehow contaminated by the materials they used to produce, that produce uh, gas in decades past. Um, and of course, uh, that, that's some the waste in the process is uh, often, uh, often referred to as really coal tar uh, and becomes also an oily substance which contaminates the soil around it. Um, so it, it requires um, quite a bit of um, safekeeping, I suppose, once it's out of the ground. And then one uh, interesting note that uh, we went through was, is it safer where it is in some circumstances than when you take it out of the ground and try to transfer it somewhere or else and then you risk the, the uh, you, you at least expose yourself to the possibility of spilling and going into somewhere where it's even more harmful than it is in its initial spot. So there's a lot of, um, of course, thought process that goes into it and is uh, addressed by EPA. Uh, but this helps kind of give us a standard to look to in the future. Of course, that doesn't mean that we're done uh, with the issues that we have. Uh, we've uh, got many other issues that will address the Muhammad Aquifer, we'll need to address to protect the Muhammad Aquifer. There's many other substances that still could be potentially stored over our water supply. Not something that we're trying to work on right now. There's legislation that's already been filed by um, my former um, chief co-sponsor for the initial bill, and he represents the area of DeWitt County where the landfill began. Uh, and I'm also working with many, um, in fact, some people in this room, uh, at the point I, you know, more than I do on some of these issues, and, and the actual Language, I think, is important that we be precise. This is not something we want to be general. This is not something we want to um, gloss over and then have to fight this in the courts three years down. We've got to be 
uh, as exactly as possible so that everyone understands the rules uh, before they begin committing to, uh, to any kind of landfill. But I think that uh, the key, uh, as I said before, is just that you continue to work with the, um, the community and uh, the uh, coalition that has been built uh, for quite some time. Now, I wanted to talk about something else. Uh, there's two other bills which are, have not been passed this year, but there's, we're only one year into a two-year legislative session, so you may see them come up again. Uh, and one in particular, which I think will be of interest to those in this room, is called Senate Bill 1434. Uh, that would amend the Illinois Solid Waste Management Act to require that the ISTCP publish a statewide resource plan and update that plan every five years. This actually came out of the task force report from, I believe it was January of this year, uh, and goes through um, the need um, to do what we, I don't think, do often enough in Springfield, which is figure out where you're going before you get there. Uh, you know, before you show up uh, somewhere, you need to have a comprehensive plan, you need to uh, put together some kind of a strategy um, and get the best minds in the room to do it. And so essentially, uh, that's what 1434 would do. 1434 is still in committee, um, but as I said, the session's got another year, brutally, uh, before, we, <laughs> before it's over. Uh, and, you know, we don't even have a budget yet, so there's, there's plenty left to do. Uh, but once that is done, um, 1434, I think, represents a real change in um, approach to the way that we deal with some of these issues, and I think it was a very, um, very wise recommendation in that task force report. Some of the things that it talks about um, is that the plan would have to include an estimate of the amount and composition of waste disposed on a, on a statewide as well as a capital basis. Uh, it, would need, it would try to develop a methodology for counties to use in, in excuse me, deeming their annual recycling and composting rate. Uh, it would develop a methodology for counties to utilize in determining their annual waste disposal rate uh, and would create a template for a five-year plan that could be updated and that counties could use when transmitting uh, their five-year updates. Uh, but essentially, it would just be an educational and public outreach program um, that would, uh, I think, help local leaders as well as those in the communities from figuring out, um, one, what is the state of, uh, uh, where are their counties at, I suppose, in, their, in, their, uh, in this process, and what can we do better, and what can we do to learn from it every five years? And that's why I think uh, 1434, once it comes out of committee, uh, will be something that will that will and should get a lot of attention from those in this room as well as those all over the state. As I mentioned, it, it essentially is a comprehensive plan to protect the ecosystem. Uh, well, this would not be new in, in many states, uh, such as there's a list there, California, Indiana. Really? We're, we're second to Indiana again? Uh, <laughs> Massachusetts, Minnesota. I mean, you can see that there's, it's not even, uh, not even, uh, even in the, just in the Midwest. Uh, so many other states have tried this, um, and I think uh, clearly this is one area where uh, we would benefit from learning from their example. And finally, I want to talk just a little bit about Senate Bill 544. This is one um, that addresses what happens to a nuclear facility once they leave town. Uh, this was based on uh, an event that happened in, in Zion, uh, and as, as Many of you know the power plant there closed down in the late 90s uh, and basically left that community saddled with the cost of paying the environmental uh, as well as other financial costs. Um, and when you think about it from a, from a financial point of view, um, then you also have, I mean, this is a community that already loses huge amounts uh, for, of their tax base when a nuclear facility leaves. Now you've got, um, in this case, it was something like 55% of the assessed value of that community leaves the community, and now you're left with a billion dollar bill to clean it up. Um, and so you've got just that uh, unbelievable one-two punch, which needs to be addressed, or at least that's uh, the filling of the uh, Illinois Senate, which passed this, passed 544 this spring, and now it's in the House, uh, awaiting, uh, I believe, assignment to committee. Um, as is pointed out here in Zion, um, in 1998, the uh, nuclear power plant power station rather, um, closed, uh, and it's now owned by Exelon, uh, which is, I think just in 2010, started that very long decommissioning process. They're talking about a $1 billion, 10-year plan um, and uh, as to how to kind of clean up um, the waste that, that is there. 
Um, and who should bear the brunt of that? And should it be the taxpayers or should it perhaps be those who profit um, at, a, at a pretty high rate while the uh, plan is, is operational? Um, and so, and in this case, as, as was noted, uh, you have that, that uh, additional note of the loss of revenue. Um, where Zion is, they put it right along the lakefront, which is pretty desirable land in the first place, or it was until you have a decommissioned nuclear plant right next door. It doesn't make for the high-rise uh, development that you might hope for. Uh, and so, you know, there's not as much development. There's some real hurt there to future uh, growth in that community. And as is mentioned there, Zion lost an estimated 55% of its property tax revenue when that uh, plant went offline. Um, and so they had to take up, make up the difference uh, by adjusting regular uh, rate increases. So again, this is a, a compounding effect, um, which has uh, been catastrophic to Zion. Uh, interestingly enough, this was not supposed to be a bookend to my earlier part, but uh, the closest nuclear power station to, um, to this campus is in Clinton, the very site of the, of the uh, Muhammad Aquifer uh, landfill site. Um, and so many of the same issues are, are at play there, not that it's being threatened to be offline, certainly not. Um, but that it's a, a huge amount of local revenue uh, for, the, for the area. Um, and so the question remains, should there be a fee assessed while these plants are in place that would help defray the cost when they go offline or if they go offline, um, rather than allow the taxpayers to have to pick up the, uh, as I said, in this case, $1 billion uh, that, the cost, that the cleanup will pay up. Um, so those are some of the bills that will be um, coming up. Uh, in, the in the last year of the session, that being 1434, which is the comprehensive plan, and 544, which is the, the nuclear um, exchange fee. Uh, and so I think that th those are some things you want to keep an eye on as we go forward. Of course, the, uh, there are other more pressing matters in Springfield, as you may have read. Uh, I don't know if they're more pressing, but they're going to be uh, up first in priority. Uh, and until those are addressed, I don't think you'll see um, either of those two, the last two bills I mentioned uh, be addressed. Uh, but certainly, I think they're important uh, when you're trying to figure out the, uh, the future of the state. So with that, uh, thank you so much. I appreciate uh, your kindness today, especially even if you didn't know in that case much more than I did on the topic. Thank you so much.